Hi, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Brain Talks. I'm Deborah Kahn, founder of Being Patient. Today, we're going to talk about lifestyle and how lifestyle um, influences the onset or slows down the onset of neurodegenerative diseases. Specifically today, we're going to talk about frontal temporal lobe dementia. That's a type of dementia that attacks the frontal cortex of your brain. Um, and uh, some of those cases, more so than early onset, are genetically linked. So joining me today, I'm really happy to have with us Caitlin Castelletto. She's with UCSF's Memory and Aging Center. Um, I might have mixed that up, Aging and Memory Center, um, and joins us from San Francisco. Welcome, Caitlin. Thank you so much, Deborah. I'm so happy to be here. So let's just start first with the, ge the genetic predisposition for people with FTD. How many of these cases are really associated with a genetic link? Yeah, so in FTD, you know, it's one of the most common forms of early onset dementia. Um, about 30% of the cases of FTD are linked with this autosomal dominant genetic form which essentially means that if you have the gene, we know that you will get the disease, as, as far as we can tell, if you live long enough. Um, so this is a really penetrant form of this dementia. So Caitlin, tell us a little bit, I mean, we know like with early onset um, Alzheimer's, there are specific genes where, I mean, you have you have some genes like APOE4, which is later onset Alzheimer's, which doesn't mean you're 100% going to get Alzheimer's, but it increases um, your chance. We know there are risk factors with that um, gene. Um, the early onset folks, um, there's been several genes that have been identified. APP, PREN1, and 2 are the three that we hear mentioned the most. If you have one of those genes, you're 100% going to get early onset Alzheimer's. So what specifically do the FTD um, um, folks have that, that means there is a genetic link? Yeah, so the three most common genes that we see in FTD um, are called MAPT, progranulin, and C9 open reading frame 72. Um, so these are the three most common genetic mutations that we see. And again, if you if someone has this mutation, we know you know pretty definitely that they will be getting this FTD form of dementia at some point in their life. So um, and. and there, there. I mean, if you look at the number of cases with early on, I mean, there's very few people who actually have the early onset genes, um, but it, it seems different with FTD. It seems like it's more of a hereditary disease. Exactly. So these sort of dominant forms of the dementia, it's only about 1% of Alzheimer's cases that have these dominant genetic forms, the APP and presenilins that you mentioned. But in FTD, it's about 30% of the dementia cases that have one of these three genes. Um, so it's a much different um, form of disease and it's much more predictable in some ways. Um, so we can identify these individuals pretty early on. Okay, and so I'm, I'm really happy we're doing this interview because when you talk about dementia, there's so much doom and gloom out there. But what your study found is in fact, we, we may not have control over whether or not we're going to get dementia, but we do have um, control over how, how um, the dementia progresses. And tell us a little bit about what specifically you found with your study. Sure. Uh, so in our study, what we did was we followed people who had one of these three genes uh, for FTD. So again, this means um, they have this genetic mutation. That means that they will get the dementia. And so the question really was, well, can lifestyle behaviors do anything in these people who we think might be predestined uh, for dementia? And excitingly, we found, you know, we measured, they sort of told us at baseline, uh, how active are they in their physical everyday life and in their cognitive everyday life? So are they jogging? Are they doing strenuous yard work, walking? Um, and also, are, are they engaging their brain cognitively? Are they reading and writing, spending time with loved ones, doing hobbies? And we found that in these gene carriers, those that had more physical and cognitive activities at baseline demonstrated a slower clinical progression of the disease year over year. It was about a 50% slower clinical um, progression per year in those with the highest amount of activities. And um, so this, again, really exciting to, to see a sort of proof of principle in people with a really dominant 
biological um, risk for dementia that perhaps these behaviors, you know, could be impacting their trajectories. So now, so specifically, I mean, I, I'm always curious about the lifestyle things because you can't babysit someone 24 seven. So how exactly did you measure um, what they were doing? And was it, was, did it pertain mostly to exercise? Um, is that what you were looking for? Cause we know like with, with the, with the um, Alzheimer's folks, um, exercise actually, we know now adds uh, mass to your hippocampus. Um, it adds brain cells, aerobic exercise. And I know there's been a lot of research on that, but tell us a little bit. I mean, the FTD folks haven't been really studied in this way, which is what makes this study really interesting. So give us a little bit of insight about specifically what the mandate was, how much exercise did they have to do? What, what types of uh, mandates did you set out? Yeah, that's a great question. And this was actually just an observational study. So we didn't actually ask them to engage in any particular types of lifestyle behaviors. We simply asked them, you know, in your day-to-day -day life, uh, and it was self-report by the patient themselves, how often are you engaging in, in jogging? How many times a week do you jog? How often do you climb stairs? And then separately, we also asked again, you know, how often are you um, sort of cognitively engaging in your world with your hobbies and your, your peers? Um, so this wasn't even necessarily asking them to do anything, but showed a correlation essentially that those that had more active lifestyles, um, again, had this slow progression of disease. And just as you mentioned, this is the first time that we're seeing that these positive effects of active lifestyle are translating into a different uh, form of dementia. So this is the first study in FTD to show that lifestyle has an effect. Um, and again, among the first, in this genetic form of any type of dementia to show that perhaps lifestyle could really be shaping your brain health um, despite this high risk. So tell us a little bit about, because we know, you know, the yeah. distinction between FTD and Alzheimer's is where it attacks the brain, right? So exactly. the way it's been explained to me is FTD really attacks the frontal cortex, which is responsible for reason, reasoning, decision-making, things like that, um, as opposed to the hippocampus where that's our memories, the memory centers of our brain. So what does it look like for FTD to evolve in the brain and how did you measure and know that it was actually slowing and slowing down the onset? Yeah, so uh, what we did was um, we asked the participants, family members, their loved ones, you know, how well are they functioning in their everyday life? Are they able to drive, take care of their um, medication management, their appointment management, sort of these everyday activities that we engage in? And then we also asked the participants themselves, they came into the lab and they completed uh, measures of memory and other thinking abilities. So these are mostly paper and pencil tests that measure different thinking skills. And so um, those are the outcomes that we were really the most interested in. Um, and so we found, um, again, this is longitudinal following these participants over time, that at baseline, that those who had more activity had um, better caregiver rated uh, functioning over time. So a slower sort of decline. And then we also found that in participants that had some atrophy in their frontal lobe, just as you were describing, um, that those that were more active actually had about two times better performance on our paper and pencil testing than their less active peers. So even despite having some of these markers of FTD ongoing in their brain, they were able to cognitively perform better than we would expect if they were more active. So when when someone has FTD, um, yeah. obviously then like cognition is is impacted. Is it because I I always thought that FTD is distinct from Alzheimer's because it you you tend to see more um, behavioral changes rather than maybe just memory. Is is that not correct? No, that's absolutely right. Um, and so the the thinking abilities that are most affected in FTD are something that we call our executive functions. Um, and our executive functions are skills like multitasking, shifting between uh, tasks really quickly. Um, it's our start and our stop, you know, being able to initiate a task, being able to inhibit ourselves from not doing a task. And we do have um, paper and pencil measures of those skills as well. But you're absolutely right that um, in FTD, uh, they also have a lot of behavioral changes. So, you know, social disinhibition, lack of empathy, um, poor apathy. 
And so we sort of captured both of those aspects, the sort of paper and pencil executive functioning, as well as these more behavioral aspects um, using the, the loved ones ratings of their behavior. Um, and so in our, in our analyses, we essentially saw effects uh, on both slightly differently, but on, on both. So where do you go from here, Caitlin? I mean, this is obviously providing great um, insight into um, how lifestyle can does in fact influence the progression of disease. Where do you go from here? Yeah, well, you know, first I have to say a big cautionary note in that these data are correlational. So this is an observational study, which essentially means that we correlated active lifestyles with better outcomes. Um, but it's certainly possible that there's the reverse relationship um, that exists. And so I think to sort of prove that lifestyle does affect the brain, the gold standard would be to do a sort of a clinical trial and to manipulate a lifestyle behavior and see its effect on the brain. Um, so we would love to, to think about developing something like that in the near future. Um, but for now, our immediate next step, we actually just launched this week, we're going to be um, capturing activity levels in a more objective way. So we're going to be sort of strapping actigraphies onto our uh, participants, just using something like a Fitbit, um, so that we can more objectively figure out, well, how many steps does it take to get to better brain health? Um, and, you know, really take out the, the bias piece that I think is sort of inherent with self-report as well. Um, so a lot, of, a lot more work to do, but this is a really a great, again, proof of principle and just hint that we're digging into the right direction. Does, um, so are, will you look at the changes in the structural changes of the brain as well? Um, because I mean, I, cause I know in Alzheimer's there's a lot of research in, in really examining the gray matter around the hippocampus and what happens when you exercise. And it's been proven now that you actually add gray model, uh, matter in the hippocampus um, from aerobic exercise, daily aerobic exercise. Um, are you ready to go there yet? Is it, can you progress to that, that stage of research? Yeah, I think that's definitely an interest of ours. And we did take a peek at that in the, the paper as well. Um, sorry, my lights just went off. <laughs> um, but uh, essentially, we, uh, we had a smaller group of people who had completed a brain MRI. And that's how we measure the brain structure, the size of the brain structure. Um, and we didn't see a very close, it was, didn't reach statistical significance. Um, essentially, that lifestyle, these lifestyle behaviors didn't um, associate with the brain structure and the participants with FTD. But I think, you know, looking at this over time and in a bigger group will be really incredibly important. So that's another component that we'll continue to pursue. Um, and okay, that great. And how do people keep up with your, your study? Like, you know, I'm sure there we have a lot of FTD folks, uh, caregivers and patients in our audience. Um, how do they keep abreast of the findings? Oh, great question. So our study is part of a consortium. It's called All FTD, A-L-L-F-T-D. Um, and you can just Google us, look us up. We have a website and all of our recent publications are on there and um, ways to get in touch with our research team. Um, again, it's multi-site. So we have sites across the United States, all the four corners, as well as in Canada. And so if someone's interested in participating in research, we would love to have you. Um, we also just recently uh, today um, had a special series um, edition in the journal Alzheimer's and Dementia where um, all of our most recent work in this group of people with FTD has been published. So this, my paper was included in that, but we have a, a bunch of incredible um, scientists uh, doing work in, into FTD and trying to understand it better. So if, if folks are interested, I'd be happy to share that link as well. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Caitlin, for joining us and, and offering us this in, insight. We really want to stay uh, in touch and find out about further fi findings, I'm sure, are really interesting to our audience. So as um, Caitlin said, you could uh, follow her research um, by the, uh, wait, sorry, the all, what was it, Caitlin? It, all oh, FTD. All FTD site. Yeah. Um, my memory is not so good right now. Yeah. The All FTD site um, conducted by UCSF. Um, and, you know, if you missed any part of this interview, of course, we upload it to beingpatient.com um, for your future reference. Share it with people who may be interested. Um, and we will continue to stay on this story and understand more about FTD. Thanks so much for joining us. Great. Thank you, Deborah.